so it's I always uh, appreciate when uh, when someone comes onto the show and they say, "Well, I listened to the episode that you did before, and uh, wow, I guess really didn't like that movie, huh?" Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I I think we're gonna have a little bit of a different opinion on this week's episode of the Culture Cast. I am still your host, Chris Stashy, much to the chagrin of many. And I am joined by the man who put the Mike White in Mike White May, not Mike White March, the host of the Projection Booth Podcast, and one of my closest friends. You've heard him here before and you're hearing him now. Mike White. You guys want to play some poker? <laughs> and also joining us all the way from the supporting the supporting characters podcast. He's the host over there on that show. You can check him out there. I have heard plenty of good things about him, but this is the first time he's on my show. Your friend and soon to be mine, Mr. Bill Ackerman. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm just here to defend Black Peter. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job today, folks. Yeah. Uh, uh, before we get into the movie uh, Taking Off, which is the uh, movie we're going to talk about in this episode, uh, Bill, tell my audience a little bit about what they could uh, find if they were to go and check out your show, Supporting Characters. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, Supporting Characters is my interview show where I talk to people that take their love of film into different projects or vocations like uh, film uh, writing or podcasting or programming, home video supplements. So just basically anything that you know, usually not filmmaking itself, but um, you just people's like origin stories, like how they got into film and how they developed those kind of projects. And so I've had Mike White on the show. I've had Heather Drain on the show. I've had um, you know, uh, Bill Lustig, Molly Haskell, Danny Perry, like a bunch of, bunch of people. I haven't done it this year, but I'll probably try to bring it back next, next year. But that's, that's the gist of the show, I guess. Is it true that the episode with me is your highest rated episode ever? It's one of them. Holy cow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mike shooting a shot and <laughs> confidently correct, apparently. Yeah. Nice, yeah. Mike. Right. I, I like the confidence. Yeah, no, <laughs> it, it gets it gets mentioned in one of the iTunes reviews too. <laughs> wow. Well, that's yeah. funny because funny enough, uh interesting segue. Mike White March is the thing that brought some of my uh, current listeners into the show as well, because they go, hey, came for Mike White March and stayed for the good conversation. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mike, for a second to tell us why we're talking about taking off on this episode. Well, if you listen to that Black Peter episode, which you can go back and find now in the Culture Cast archives, you would hear that this whole month is all about Milos Forman films that I've never seen. And and I'm so surprised that Father Malone isn't here with us because he's the king of you've never seen. But yeah, I've never seen Taking Off. It's uh, kind of a weird blind spot for me. I've tracked this movie down in various forms over the years because it was or uh, it might still be. But I think it was was very tough to find for a while. This was like this missing Foreman film for a little bit, which is odd because I'm not sure why that would be unless it's like a music right thing. But this is right between his last Czech film and then his major breakout, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. This was his first American film. And it's this really neat hybrid between what he was doing in Czechoslovakia and what he would do in the U.S. And yeah, I, I am very interested to hear what you guys have to say about this. But yeah, this whole month we are talking about foreign films that I've never seen. So on that note, let's talk a little bit about 1971's Taking Off. So it is directed by Milos Forman, though my iPhone would uh, correct that every time I type it in as Milo's Forman. So Milo's Forman, whoever the Forman is, Milo has one. And it is uh, it, it is a film directed by Milos Forman. It stars Lynn Carlin, Buck Henry, Georgia Engel, and Tony Harvey, along with some uh, very familiar, very young faces, including oh boy. the best the best cast ever, Bobo Bates, otherwise known as Kathy Bates. And when I told people that that was her name today, people were like, you're fucking lying. No, I'm not. Even though it sounds as crazy as it sounds, Bobo Bates is in this movie. And what's it about? Well, <clears throat> Lynn Carlin and Buck Henry play Lynn and Larry Tyne, uh, two parents whose daughter runs away to go audition with aforementioned young starlets. And, uh, well, they spend the rest of the movie trying to find her. She comes back, then she leaves. They try to find her again, and hilarity ensues. Hilarity being the key word here. So, Bill, I'm going to kick it to you first. When was the first time you saw it taking off? What did you think then? And what do you think now having to rewatch it for the culture cast? Um, so this one, I think I saw, I think in like 10 or 11 segments on YouTube, right. like it was the one of the first or second films I ever saw on YouTube. I had been looking for it for a few years by the time that I saw it, because um, I had read about it 
I guess in the context of that Ned Tannen slate of films that Universal made in the wake of Easy Rider, like it's the same group of films that uh, The Hired Hand and the last movie and Tulane Blacktop and Minnie Moskovitz and Silent Running. It was like all these films that were made for about a million bucks or so that were like trying to cash in on that that kind of youth culture, easy rider wave. And so I was curious because I had seen, you know, Cuckoo's Nest and Amadeus and some of the American films. And I'd seen, I think I'd already seen Loves of a Blonde and Fireman's Ball as well. So I was, I was interested in Milos Foreman and I was like, oh, this is this film in the middle between those two periods of his career. What could it be like? And so uh, I was surprised that it was actually like, like a like a drug scare film done as gentle comedy because there's a <laughs> film I love from the year before I think called The People Next Door uh, that uh, has a very similar kind of plot but like a uh, but played as like a melodrama um, that one has um, a, a girl taking drugs and running away to New York City and her parents kind of freaking out and finding her and it becomes this whole heavy thing a lot of TV movies in the 70s kind of have those kind of premises and Taking Off feels like that same kind kind of plot but done as uh yeah like a gentle satire well closer to the feeling of fireman's ball and you know so i thought it was like i i've always really liked it i've always been kind of sad that it's been hard for people to see it i know it had a blu-ray which i have through park circus that kind of went out of print very quickly i don't know if it's a music rights thing like mike had said but universal has never put this out on home video in america I remember Criterion hinting that they were going to do it like 10 years ago, but I don't know if they were just saying that or if they, I know that sometimes they take a while to get to things or if, if they ran into the same kind of rights problems that like kept people from doing California Split. But um, yeah, no, it's 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 probably the Milos Forman film I've seen the most, honestly, like of mm-hmm. all of his movies. But it's, I don't know, it's 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 a new Hollywood film too. And that's also, I'm a big sucker for new Hollywood films and New York films of that period. So um, I'm excited to talk about it with you both. Uh, what did you think of it? I'm going to kick it to you, Mike. Oh, uh, yeah. I found this fascinating. Like I said, this is kind of a hybrid between what he was doing in Czechoslovakia, this whole idea of, you know, we talked last week about the film he did called Audition. And this is kind of a redux of Audition with uh, so much of these cutaways and these longer scenes of these girls auditioning and singing and playing guitar. And I mean, you get to meet uh, Bobo Bates, as you said, as well as Carly Simon showing up. And so many of these girls, no offense, ladies but there's a lot that just sound really pitchy and reedy when they're singing and then all of a sudden carly simon comes on screen you're like oh this is a real singer okay wow um (laughs) it's so apparent oh yeah so apparent freaking amazing but yeah i i love the whole idea of us cutting back to this this is a really good method for us to do this and i love this whole idea of you know you're talking bill about this being like a drug scare film but i don't know if we see Janine Tyne taking drugs too much, but we oh, definitely yeah. see her parents drinking a lot and taking drugs. This is really showing that maybe the kids are all right, but the parents are really fucked up. Yeah. Well, that's the thing with P- the people next door is the film that reminds me of, but the people next door, it, it's it's like, on the one hand, it's like the parents are afraid of, of the kids doing drugs, but they're drinking a lot. They're smoking. They're, they're yeah. having affairs, like all of the corruption that they fear that their kids have, like it's on them. And this kind of does that even more. So like, the, like you're saying, yeah, like they, I think what do they find like evidence that maybe she smoked in the bedroom, but yeah, you're right. It's just like the, the young people are, uh, you know, they they just want to do music and, you know, they want to make money ultimately at the end, too, with the with the pianist, you know, boyfriend at the end. It's it's, you know, it's the generation gap thing. But like, who are the real freaks in this equation? You know, because the, 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 the parents are the ones that seem to be out of control, uh, which I think is the joke. <laughs> yeah. And apparently Foreman was offered, hey, do you want to make this film about hippies? And he's like, well, actually, the parents are more interesting than the hippies are. So I'm going to stick with the parents and, you know, you've got a lot of non-professional actors here again, like we were talking about before. So like the girl that plays Janine is a non-professional actor. And then you take your main characters and I, I don't know how much work uh, Tony Harvey had. He seems to have a pretty scant filmography, but you know, Georgia Engel, who I grew up with on the Mary Tyler Moore show, or Audra Lindley, you see her everywhere. Paul Benedict, you know, Justice I had God no idea. 
Yeah, I had no idea until uh, Spinal Tap just what a great actor Paul Benedict was because I mostly grew up with him on the Jeffersons and he plays that character great, but I had no idea the range that he has and just how freaking funny this guy can be. And then, you know, you've got your Vincent Schiavelli and just these like smaller roles. You've got some very competent actors. Uh, Lynn Carlin as Lynn Tyne. Um, I mostly know her as the voice of uh, the spaceship on Battle Beyond the Stars. And then, of course, Buck Henry, who's freaking amazing. And yeah. you just know that he's going to knock a performance like this out of the park, which he does. Yeah. And John Garfield, too, since you mentioned oh, directors. God. Yeah. And and in, and, and in the audition scene, you know, obviously the big people, you know, Carly Simon and Kathy Bates, but you even have a cameo from uh, Jessica Harper before she yes. uh, got famous is it one of the uh, auditioners. So that's just also a shot fun. of her face. It's just her in the crowd and then it cuts away. We don't, yeah. we know but she but, can sing. But we she's know called, she can sing. And she's called out by full name too. Yeah. But it's, yeah. But it's like a few years before she's introducing Jessica Harper and Phantom of the Paradise and things right. like that. I know. I, I was like, the the first time I watched it, I caught her and I was like, oh, I hope she gets to sing. No, <laughs> she does or not. Or dance and have that awesome hat that she wears <laughs> in Fan of the Paradise. We call that suggestive twirling is what she does in that. Just <laughs> <laughs> that's what, Her dancing in Phantom of the Paradise is is is, is truly spectacular. Um, oh, yeah. You know, what's funny about this movie, I think, you know, you, you guys have both already kind of touched on it a lot, is the idea of like, you know, and we say, I mean, we, you know, folks like myself say, are the straights okay, right? Like that's, you know, that's kind of this same idea of like, oh, the normal people, what are they up to? And like, they they think we're all weirdos, but look at them playing strip poker, which like, never even done that as an adult or ever. Like it's, it the things that they're doing are things that, Again, they're perceiving these kids as like the complete degenerates that have lost their minds. And it's like, no, nah, I think you guys have lost your minds. Um, and yeah, I haven't seen a whole lot of Buck Henry stuff, if any. I haven't seen any of the things that he's directed or worked on other than The Graduate. Um, so I didn't know what to expect from him. And he just plays like a normal guy really well. I, I am assuming that's his shtick more or less is just like, a guy who can sing, but I, I don't know. Like I, I, it all felt very naturalistic. It felt very much like what I was expecting from Milos Foreman with the, the Czech new wave stuff, but then kind of filtered through the lens of yeah, the weirdness of the seventies and the culture clash of the seventies between the old and the young, the, you know, the expectations of the old of what the young are doing, the young seemingly trying to just stay out of the way of the old people, like the older generation, like not get involved in their nonsense while the older people are constantly getting involved in what the younger people are doing to the point where they have a young girl at like a, where did our kids go mm -hmm. conference? And she's like, there's ask, they're asking her if they've seen their kids. And she's like, no, no, no. But it's like, what the fuck do you expect is going to happen? Like, even if she had seen them, she's not going to say anything like that's the point here is nobody wants to play along with one another. And I, I enjoyed it. I did enjoy it. I think the first time I watched it, I didn't, I didn't appreciate how strange the storytelling device that they were going to be using in the first half of the film is because the audition thing, it does come back a little bit, but it's a lot less pronounced once we kind of get to the Buck Henry looking for his daughter in earnest part of the yeah, well, I, I think one thing that makes it enjoyable for me is that I feel like this premise could be like intolerably wacky had they played it too big as far as like, oh, the, the parents are smoking pot and, the, you know, it's like, all, yeah. you know, kind of hijinks and strip poker. But I think one thing I like about it um, is that it has like this bemused lack of urgency, <laughs> even though it's like this melodramatic premise, like they're looking for it, but they also take time to like fool around with eggs in a bar for five minutes or, yeah. you know, or they, or, or, or tell, you know, tell like sex stories on the couch. Like it's not really like, even when they don't, catch up with her right away and so or like they they lose the daughter that they're chasing and you know the other kids uh the other kid in the uh in the new york scene like it's not like i don't know it's it, it's not a high-pitched emotional stakes kind of situation like they're they'll find her when they find her right <laughs> and i right. think that that's kind of i don't know it, it I think I think like comedy from this period can sometimes feel like a little bit broad and 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 big and and this this has big moments but I think it's I think it's helped by the fact that it is kind of got this detachment of somebody that's like new to the country kind of exploring the culture 
with this kind of like more detached feel for something that could be played a little bit high pitched. It just speaks yeah, the to whole... the idea of the kids in the seventies just disappearing. Like it, it wasn't a big deal. Now, if that's happening, it's you know Amber Alert and everything else. But it's like, oh, okay, yeah, okay. Like I guess my kid just left. Like all right, like kids will be kids. The the woman at the restaurant or the coffee shop who just wants nothing to do with helping people find their lost loved ones it, to the point where she's just like, I don't want to get involved. And it's so funny that she has an accent because I'm just like, is this Milos talking about what's going on in Czechoslovakia at the moment? Just this foreign lady who's just like, Mm-mm, nope. I don't want to talk about it. I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to tell you the address of this place. Like, is she just that detached or is she protecting herself or is she protecting her patrons? She just wants nothing to do with his help and, or helping him, I should say. And yeah, I really appreciate that part. And he's just so, you know, oh, I got to help this girl. I got to save her. And then when her mom comes along, the, the girl's just like, get me the hell out of here. I don't want anything to do with this woman. Just running away, like literally running away, a literal runaway. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, and like he is so, I'm amazed that he was able to put two and two together because he is so incompetent through so much of this movie talking about them at the bar and just drinking rather than looking for the daughter. They're supposed to be out, you know, searching the streets and he and Tony Harvey are just knocking them back at the local bar, come home drunk. And I think that's one of the times where she just ends up coming home. You know, she's not even missing. And then at the end of the movie, the exact same thing happens again. She just happens to come home. You know, she never really ran away to begin with. She just wasn't there when they were looking for her. Yeah. And his violence when he comes back, after drinking is what sends her running away yeah. for real. So it's that, which again is ironic. And I also was just thinking about like what you mentioned and how this is a blend of amateur and, and, and professional actors. Cause I think that it really, I, I know that this is the last film he does that with. And I think he felt like he didn't have a grasp on it because of the language barrier, but I think it works perfectly in this. And I think that you have, people like John Garfield that are like like these New York character actor types that can be big and can they can build a kind of a character like a big bigger than life performance and you have people like the daughter uh who was like like the daughter of a minister like not a professional actor never did any of the films before or since and she's just like a real person in those scenes and it it just brings the energy level down but not to the point where it flatlines like it's not like awkward when you have the people that aren't really putting on any big presentation it's just some people are like that. And that's how the scenes kind of, they, they feel like more naturalistic that way, but not in a way that's like you have Buck Henry and Lynn Carlin doing one kind of thing. And then like the musician boyfriend and the daughter doing another kind of thing. Like it all kind of meshes. To, I think it meshes together. I don't know if Foreman thought it totally worked. I think it does. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if he's down on this or would have been down on this movie. It doesn't seem like it was something he talked about a ton. Um, and yeah, maybe he wasn't happy with what was going on. I know it took him a long time to write it. He and uh, Jean-Claude Carrier were kind of moving around a lot just to come up with uh, time and space to actually write this script. They went to Paris and they were there right as May 68 was happening. So then Foreman goes back to uh, Czechoslovakia and is like, hey, Jean-Claude, come on over. And that's when the Prague Spring starts a few months later. So it's just like he's running from revolution to revolution, trying to find the time to write this script, which is hilarious to me because it really you know, to what everything we've been saying, it doesn't feel that scripted. It feels very, here's a scene, here's a scene, here's a scene. And you're going to take these, you know, very good at improv actors and just kind of turn them loose a little bit. There's probably more written down than I even think about, but you know, you think about things like, Oh, well, how about we have uh Georgette uh, from Mary Taylor Moore start doing, you know, nude aerobics and singing a song, <laughs> you know, like th- those are great bits and i don't know if that's in the script or if they just kind of improv that stuff you know i know that they were writing the they they had a script but i think what they were doing was they were presenting scenes to the actors and then having them put put it in your own words and so like Mm -hmm. it wasn't like they were learning lines like word for word and so that that also probably accounts for some of the the way that it feels very improvisational like that whole poker game at the end just feels totally improv yeah it just feels like buck henry going I'm okay taking everything off and standing here and singing. 
Well, he didn't tell the actors in advance who was winning which hand. So yeah. there was some spontaneity to it for the actors. That's right. He, he uh, gamed the deck, didn't he? Yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, and it's the last film that he is involved with the writing in this way, because I feel like after this, he tries to get a few scripts off the ground, uh, including the collaboration with Paul Zimmerman that later became King of Comedy for Scorsese. But I don't think he... I think from One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest on, it's other people's material. He just becomes like a, not a, not a journeyman, but I guess, yeah, I guess kind of like just taking his approach to other people's material. I think this is the last one that really seems to come from him, like feels more of a piece of the Czech films. And then he becomes just a Hollywood pro from Cuckoo's Nest on. Mm -hmm. Well, and what I wonder is, would this have been sustainable anyways, or was this the, always going to be his last gasp of like, I have to somehow cement my own style here while also kind of playing within the expectations of American cinema at the time, at least the new Hollywood cinema that was going on. I wonder if like there was no way to go beyond this anyways with what he was doing, because West, you know, Western audiences may not have been as engaged as maybe Czechoslovakian audiences would be. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, when I look at Taking Off, I mean, I think of films like The Man Who Fell to Earth or Paris, Texas, or like any kind of films that are like established European filmmakers making film in America and Americana, however they see it, like through kind of an offbeat lens, I think. Um, and I, I don't know how many films you can make in that vein that are going to feel that fresh. I mean, I don't know if he intended to become like a Billy Wilder kind of figure where it's like he just adopted, you know, like he, he just, he had had like, you know, just had more resources to do the thing he was doing in another language. But yeah, I don't know like what it would have happened had this been like a big success. I mean, it was critically well received, but yeah, nobody went to go see it. And he also didn't make any money at all from it. Like, I think he passed up his director's fee for back end part profit, participation and because it had no profits basically he did the film for free and because it never even had a home video life i don't know that he ever saw a penny for taking off ever um so that's that probably does not help i mean it, it opened probably some doors i think michael douglas might have liked it which is helpful in getting cuckoo's nest so it's not like it hurt him but it it, it didn't it didn't like kickstart his career quite as quickly and then he couldn't go backwards either because he wanted to make one more film and they just wouldn't let him go back and make another czech film like in the old system either so he had to he had to make a go of it in america yeah, there's also been a lot of debate about did Foreman abandon Czechoslovakia? Was he somebody that took advantage and was like, well, okay, screw you guys. I'm going to go to America and make my fortune there. I mean, I've read different things and there are a lot of different POVs and he would say, no, that's not how this was. And I, like you said, I think he did want to go back even after the Prague Spring and try to make the system work for him. But they weren't having it. I mean, I, I can't see him being able to do what he was doing. I mean, because the, the fireman's ball is pretty scathing uh, indictment of a lot of the stuff that was going on in Czechoslovakia at the time. I don't see the new government saying, yeah, come on in and criticize us. If anything, I think he would have been really neutered had he gone back to Czechoslovakia. And it was only natural for him to come to America and really do it up. And he was one of quite a few people that came to the U S and some people did better than others. I mean, we talked on the projection booth about even passer and just how that went for him. And, you know, he's, he had an interesting career. I mean, Cutter's way is freaking fantastic. Some yeah. of the other films, maybe not that great, but he definitely, I mean, the landlord, that yeah. was amazing. So he, he, he's in good company. Foreman's in good company of these other expats coming over some stay, some go back, you know, like we talked to Chris about Yancey and I think he left the country for a while. He worked in New York and then there were others that went to Germany and things just to get away from the repressive government. Say so Yasni yeah, I mean, worked in Canada towards the end of his career. I mean, yeah. he was, he was no longer operating within Czech new wave or Czechoslovakian filmmaking either. So, I mean, I understand those criticisms because I read them too about, Oh, did you just use this as a jumping off point? But I mean, it's that's always going to be the case unless yeah. you literally just stay there the whole time. Unless you yeah. stay there the whole time, then that singular 
opening opportunity will always be seen as a, a stepping stone or a, a step up for, you know, for you to use to get somewhere else. I know there's still a lot of butthurt around uh, his role in Khan from 68, which was right around the time of the student revolution. And did he set up his other filmmaker friends to fail by joining with the French and saying, yeah, screw this Khan's film festival. We, we don't need it. Or did he just kind of get pushed into the wrong place at the wrong time? It really, you know, every every story has three points of view. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like after taking off, I could have imagined him just as easily going to Paris because he had that connection with Truffaut and Claude Berry and like people that were not just good directors, but like big producers, like powerful people. Like he could have been set up to make the next film there. He could have had a career like Zhuaski or even like late stage Bunuel as far as like, you know, becoming a French filmmaker. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, you know, I'm glad he stuck it out. I mean, I like the films he made in America, but yeah, it sounded like a tough couple of years after taking off before he had his real breakthrough here. Yeah. I mean, there were four years between this and Cuckoo's Nest, so they're probably pretty lean for him. Yeah. 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 Well, and it also, I mean, you know, when when you come back to something like this and you look at the people that are involved in this, I mean, it's not like, I mean, again, obviously Cuckoo's Nest is a, is a kind of a different animal given the amount of people that are in that movie. I mean, this has a rather large cast, but it's not the same kind of expectations that that movie has. I mean, you can see form and style here, but it is that naturalistic thing that really comes through by just allowing the actors to do what they do best. And in a lot of ways, like that's, it feels like that's a lost thing. I mean, you don't hear about it as much now. And when you do hear about it, we get things like, you know, it feels like this is an old pinata that keeps coming up. People keep bringing out, but Ghostbusters 2016, a lot of the Current, I mean, when we talk about improvisation now in film, it's almost entirely stuck in the comedy realm. And I mean, this is a comedy, but they're not telling jokes all the time. It's not jokes about wonton soup. And it's interesting to see a different approach to this, you know, from 71, given that now the expectation for something like this is so drastically different. But here it's like stick to the script more or less, but also you have some freedom within the scenes to make them your own, to do something interesting, to allow Buck Henry to be Buck Henry, because clearly he knows what he's doing. So a director putting faith in actors this much is just, again, not that we don't see it anymore, but I don't know if that's an expectation as much as it used to be. Did in... Cuckoo's Nest is very fascinating because it feels like the patients, a lot of the patients anyway, are just regular people. Maybe he found them in a psych ward or something. And then you realize, oh no, you know, this is again, Vincent Schiavelli showing up, this Christopher Lloyd, this is uh, Michael Berryman. I mean, you look around and you're like, oh no, most of these, if not all of these people are actors, but he's directing them in such a naturalistic fashion and giving them that, that, that rope in order to let them go. You know, he's, he's taking the tethers off of a lot of these actors so they can just do what they want to do. And it feels like those roles are a little less structured as others, but you do have professional actors in those roles. I mean, this is a film, like like I mentioned earlier, that was uh, partly put into production because people were trying to get the next Easy Rider. And I think yeah. Easy Rider, people assumed that some of that was improvised, you know, certainly like the cemetery scenes and same improvisation would have been. And, and also like the influence of European films on American uh, cinema of that late 60s, early 70s period. I think it's rare that you have like someone actually from one of those European new wave movements directing a film in Hollywood like that. I mean, you might have, you have Antonioni right before this doing Zabriskie Point. You have Truffaut a few years earlier doing Fahrenheit 451, but you really don't have like a lot of the big names for those movements working in Hollywood. And um, it's interesting that Foreman and to a lesser extent, someone like Louis Maul, like there's only a handful of people that really fit in the American system and, and have success. But, but I think Foreman is definitely the biggest at least he has some of the biggest individual hits you know as far as award-winning uh commercial smashes but it's it's interesting because yeah i mean i think that they I, I don't know if they were planning for this to be necessarily like an awards film but maybe so because i mean he's coming off of fireman's ball and love loves of a blonde so it's like it seems on paper like it would make sense and i i don't know why maybe they lost faith in it by the time that it even got in front of people because i don't think it even really opened that wide even with good reviews they just didn't know how to sell it because buck henry and lynn carlin were not exactly movie stars i mean lynn carlin had done the cassavetes film but i mean she gets um pretty 
sidelined into mom roles quite soon after this. Um, she, this is like right around the same time she does Death Dream with Bob Clark. And even by uh-huh. that point, it's like B-horror kind of projects that she's being invited to do. And Buck Henry, I think, even though he's got a bit part in The Graduate, I actually knew him as a kid because he was a host on SNL in the 70s. Like he was kind of a pushed lot, as like a yeah. comedy star. Uh-huh. Um, but I think at the time he would have been a screenwriter that Mila Forman met like at parties in Hollywood or in New York and was like, oh, it'd be fun to have your energy for the, for the father. Um, but I mean, he went on to do like the man who fell to earth and all sorts of uh, acting parts. But um, so it's easy to take for granted that like people would not have been used to him as a movie star mm. in, uh, in, at this point. I mean, he would have just been the bellhop that's impatient as, as Dustin Hoffman's trying to check into the uh, hotel and the graduate. And that's about it. I don't even know that he had cameos on uh, Get Smart and things that he was writing on television. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm not sure if he did or not either. And then I know he wrote Catch-22 a few years later, but I can't yeah. remember if he was in that at all. Yeah, um, he also uh, was one of the writers on What's Up Doc, which was a huge movie. Oh, but yeah. I think that's after this. Um, yeah, it is. It it's is. a year after this, I think. Which I just saw earlier this year, and I really enjoyed. Um, I was I, that was the thing. I guess that was the only thing I thought going into this was not that madcap nature, but that like weird seventies comedy feel that only like these kinds of seventies movies have. And I think it. I think it succeeds. I don't know how quote funny the movie is unquote. It has its comedic moments. I think ultimately it's like being funny is not necessarily the most rewarding thing for what this movie's going for is to make people chuckle out of their seats. But I think when it is funny, like when Paul Benedict gets up and says, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling yes. the vibrations. Like <laughs> that is comedy gold. Like that's perfect. That's exactly what I was expecting from this is like a weird sideways look at a part of the culture that these people feel imminently out of touch with to the point where that lady is like, how much weed is this? Like how much could I get in trouble for this? Like this mm-hmm. amount of weed. Like it's that, it's that out of touchness that I think sometimes permeates some of these seventies films where it's like the filmmakers are ahead of the culture and the culture is kind of having to maybe meet them a little bit further than they feel comfortable with at least mainstream society. Cause again, this is not necessarily aimed at the mainstream, but the people that they're lampooning are definitely like a mainstream older audience. Yeah, I think it's actually trying to appeal to both sides of the generation gap, which is always kind of tricky because mm-hmm. I think um, I think the the younger people wanted to be flattered. They wanted to have love story or the graduate or things that like kind of presented their struggle as romanticized. And I think that the, their parents probably wanted to have the counterculture demonized and to have them, you know, kind of authority in control, making the right calls. And so the fact that they're both being gently lampooned in different ways, I think. Uh, is why it doesn't feel didactic, but also why it might not have been a bigger success. I think I think that's kind of a, a very polarized time. And for a film not to be really talking about Vietnam or talking about like hot button issues that way, I mean, it, it calls out the ludicrous drug charge thing. Like it has like its small bits of like education on on behalf of its causes but it's not really it's it's just kind of poking gentle fun at both sides of it i think um but you yeah. mentioned comedy i think that vincent chiavelli i mean uh yeah. it's like a warm-up for his teacher in fast times at richmond high which is the role i most associate him with but it, yeah i mean i guess uh I, I i think i smile more than i laugh out loud when i watch it like it's that kind of comedy for me but smiling's all right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah right. i found it more amusing than hilarious but uh, the scene with Chiavelli and when he's describing like don't bogart the joint and all this i'm just like this is great stuff and that's all i had ever seen in the movie beforehand was just that bit of it um i don't even remember probably in some sort of foreman documentary um but yeah it, it definitely lived up to the hype i was like as soon as he showed up i was like oh this is the scene all right and it was as good as i thought it would be because it went on for a lot longer than i'd ever seen before and i would say it's definitely the scene that you could show to most people out of context and get a chortle out of and i i I do think honestly as someone who you know does smoke marijuana fairly regularly it's actually a pretty good uh you know set of steps and advice on how to actually smoke a joint correctly 
don't bogart the goddamn thing, folks. I do love that. I do love that they say the terms that they're using at the time. And then they mention, you know, I like how Vincent Schiavelli also goes, make sure all the roaches come back to me. Make sure I get all the roaches back. (laughs) It's like, yeah, all right. I get it. We all get it. If you get it, you get it. Like, and that's, I, I, I agree. I mean, Vincent Schiavelli, I mean, he's just, he's such a dynamic actor, right? And he, I mean, oh, he yeah. commands the scene because of, well, because of the way he looks, but, you know, just because you look that way doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to command it beyond that, but he does in everything. Like you mentioned, Bill, I mean, in Fast Times, he also shows up in an episode of the X-Files where he plays a guy with a conjoined twin at one point, and he's fantastic. He's just a, a great one of the great character actors, obviously. Was that the one where they're down in Florida? Yeah, with the uh it's a, like they're like the carnival, yeah. Right, yeah. And he plays like the brother stuff. with the the he's like the sad sack brother. And yeah. it's it's per, it's a perfect Vincent Schiavelli role. Let's just put it that way. It's very basket case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, I think I think as far as like scenes that people would have talked about at the time, I think that the scene where the parents uh, smoke is is probably one of the things that people talked about, and also the uh, Mary Mitchell's "Ode to a Screw" song. The uh, mm. which cause, I mean, you have to think that like just four letter words like fuck in dialogue would have been a relatively new thing. So for a song like that to be in a Hollywood film would have been kind of kind of a bold move move i mean i mean it's still kind of something you wouldn't see in a lot of well i mean you would see it in the film now but I, yeah i mean mash would have been the year before i mean i'm i think that there was what like there was there was one or two other films that like i think precede mash that might have had fuck in the dialogue but it's really relatively new so for for a song like that to be in the film would have been confrontational i think for audiences then Mm-hmm. Well, we're one year. I mean, we're one year before Carlin's Seven Dirty Words. So, yeah. And yeah, like I was when I heard it the first time, I was like, "What is she fucking saying?" Oh, she she's saying "screw" and "fuck." Like, I I I didn't expect it because, again, like you just mentioned, Bill, the expectation is there's not going to be anything like that. Like that, what could be considered transgressive at the time? But like, it mm-hmm. just made me laugh because, again, the woman singing it or girl singing it is so young and so just kind of an ingenue and there she is talking about oh to fuck me and i'll fuck you but fuck me first and it's like whoa what the but again <laughs> it it kind of it's leaning into that the you know the kids aren't all right maybe like eh, you know then the then the parents are humping and screwing and getting into all sorts of fun later in the movie so it's that juxtaposition like you mentioned that it does work i mean that's those two juxtapositions just end up making this a movie that it feels like such a bummer that a big or small, however you want to perceive it, like boutique label hasn't gone out of their way to sort out the rights issue and and get this out. Because I think more people than I realized would probably really enjoy this movie and would have a lot to say and like dig into it as well. Yeah, well, I think most of those films that were part of that Ned Tannen slate like disappeared right after that because The Hired Hand used to be hard to see. The last movie used to be hard to see. I think right now... I Meaning Moskovitz is kind of hard to see right now. Um, I mean, that had a DVD, but it's been out of print for a long time. So I guess, yeah, Universal has a bunch of films like this, like, and not just that slate, but I mean, Mike, and, you know, I talked about Puzzle of a Downfall Child. That was hard to see for a long time. Played as it lays is that way. There's a few I want to things say like that. that uh, Peter Watkins's Privilege was amongst that slate as well. And that was tough to find for a long time. Yep. Yep. That, um, there's, there's a few. Um, yeah. Yeah, Diary of Mad Housewife up until recently was hard to see. Uh-huh. Um, I think that might have been because of the music. But yeah, it's just when, when and I talked to Don Coscarelli about this because he had a film around this time called Jim the World's Greatest Universal put out. And I'm like, is it the music? He's like, no, they just don't care. It's mm. it's it's sometimes they just, it's not a priority and they don't make it a priority to make it available to the boutique labels either. So um yeah, now that's that could be the case with with this one, which is weird because yeah, it's a lot of big names. I mean, Carly Simon. It's funny because Carly Simon. It's the same year that um, that's the way I heard it should be comes out, but it's bef- it's after taking off has already come and gone from theaters. But you find newspaper listings for this movie later in the seventies, and they're like starring Buck Henry with Carly Simon. <laughs> like yeah. they push they push those like twenty seconds of Carly Simon. It's like oh, the biggest se- singer of the seventies is in this <laughs> movie. Come come see her in it. So funny. And if she doesn't show up again, you'll be really disappointed at that sorts with everybody else in the theater who's also there to see Carly Simon. 
Yeah. But she, I mean, she's a welcome presence, just like uh, the other well-known musical act that shows up later in the movie, Ike and Tina Turner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. It's so great seeing her and her backup dancers and just, yeah, that was great. I yeah. do like everything in that scene, though, with the two creepy guys, I guess, or two overbearing gentlemen who come to Lynn Carlin's table looking for, well, some ass is the only mm-hmm. way of putting it. Those two dudes are... uh Again, just another drop in the bucket of the straights aren't okay, folks. They're having their own problems. You know, pulling pulling a Clark Griswold and bumbling into someone's room half dressed, going, "Oh, oops, I didn't, I didn't know." Yeah. I love that. And Buck Henry's just sitting there, like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that that their scene reminds me of something like out of Loves of a Blonde, like that, just like overly pushy, kind of like uncomfortable, would be seducing kind of guys, like yeah, of a certain age at the other table type of thing. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or even going back to Black Peter, the bricklayer and his, and the other guy that works for the with the bricklayer, right? Yeah. Those two dudes, yeah. I can there totally wasn't enough that. ahoy saying though in this yeah. movie. I was just ahoy. <laughs> <laughs> I was thoroughly disappointed that Buck Henry just didn't say ahoy like eight times to the yeah. camera. Just yeah. scream it at somebody's <laughs> face, Alan Garfield's face, yeah. <laughs> Well, we do similarly to Black Peter, though, we do have a scene where we spend a lot of time in a kind of enclosed dance hall type room. And to contrast it to that movie, I think it works. I think the same idea works a lot better here where we're just kind of going around and following these kind of disparate groups of people. And then they kind of they do this. This movie does what Black Peter doesn't, which that movie doesn't bring it all together in the end into one kind of idea that they're grasping at. I like that you have all these characters introduced and then it kind of starts coming together. And then we have Vincent Schiavelli introduced and we understand then what is actually happening here with all these hot smoking adults. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's a really cute film and I can see, you know, if people think it's uneven or a little long in parts, but I don't know. Overall, I think it holds together and it's kind of strange that it does with the audition sequences and the rest of the film because they don't tie together completely a lot of times. Like, yes, it's the daughter going for the audition, but they stay on that audition a long time. And it's a really good thing to cut back to later on in the film, because we keep cutting back to it when we're way past that section, but it works as a good break and it works as a good transition for other things. Yeah. I think I heard about audition well after i saw this film so i think when i caught up with that i was expecting it to feel more like taking off than it Mm -hmm. actually does but because that's that feels more like a straight-up documentary that he's willed on some kind of makeshift plot to give it some kind of hook but this this feels like yeah, it's i don't it doesn't really even feel like a greek chorus i'm i've always kind of thought about like what is it trying to say because it's all young women uh, Mm -hmm. so it's not like necessarily like trying to be a snapshot that represents the entire youth culture um i mean it does it does show like that she's she's running away from home in a sense but only to maybe break into show business or some kind of uh status some kind of career so it's it's not really a bohemian thing that she's it, it, on the surface it might seem that way but she's she's going out to maybe break into break it into some kind of big career uh but she 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 uh she chokes the way the girl does in in the earlier film which i guess is maybe the the connection is like uh she can't she can't sing and and, and break through and maybe that that uh connects them but it i guess it does set her up with the boyfriend do you know the story about the boyfriend um at the at the dinner scene at the end, I, I don't remember the exact dollar amount, but he wouldn't he wouldn't say the dollar amount because he said ninety five thousand dollars. Yeah, and he's like, I I never made that much money in my life, and I because I'm playing myself, I can't lie on camera, and so huh. like they had to do the math. It's like actually after taxes, this is how much you really are making. Like they tricked him with math, and so he would do the line, but then just starts like improvising like off what he really thinks about like how like you pay for these you write these songs that like you wind up paying for the things that made you mad enough to write those songs. And, you know, I guess I can live with those kind of contradictions, but it's just like, that's him just really talking about how he feels. And it's, it's so perfect. (laughs) Real quick. I want to call out Phil Bruns. Who's the police officer. Who's totally clueless. They bring in our main couple and he's like, Oh, I found your daughter. And they come in and it's not their daughter at all. And he's just so confused. Like, yeah, that's your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> He's got such a great face and he just 
he was kind of one of those like ever present figures when I was growing up. He would just be in so many things. I'm surprised, Chris, that we haven't seen him in Barney Miller because he's got a real Barney Miller face. Well, he was on Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, right? I believe so. Yeah. A show that we've kicked around talking about. I think, I think Richard might be a fan of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. He's, he's great. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know (laughs) if I could do all the episodes of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, because it's like hundreds of episodes. Yeah. It's a lot. It's, 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 it's it's more than any sane people would take on. Yeah. Which is one thing you say about great faces. And that's actually something I think is interesting is because, um, when I think about the Czech films he made, I think of all the great faces then he, oh, because yeah. he wasn't like limited to like who could act <laughs> like he could just find the great faces locally and that would be his cast. And I think that it's so funny that he went to New York, which is full of great faces. Some of them are actors, some of them are not. But mm-hmm. it's not like he goes to California to get into movies and like where everyone is either a movie star or looks like the next movie star like he's finding all the great character actor faces and i mean that's one thing that i love about new york comes in that period it's like it's just full of people like john garfield uh you know and this is perfect for someone that has that kind of knack for interesting faces and and actually uh, this is something some writers commented on at the time which i didn't think about it's not a lot of dialogue i mean mm-hmm. in this film like there's a lot that's handled silently which i i just never thought of it because there's so much music and things coming at you that you're not like it's not like you're just watching people silently do things but you you are i guess uh, in a way i mean there's i mean there is a fair amount of dialogue but it's not like on the average i think it's quieter like you know than um certainly a lot of other things at young people well and and boy, I mean, the 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 way I mean, the, you know, when when you have the character who's meant to be the analog for the young people barely even getting a word in edgewise, like she doesn't even ha- talk about not a lot of lines. She has like two or three, maybe mm-hmm. if that like she is the one who says essentially nothing throughout yeah. the entire movie, which I again, I mean, you you asked Bill, like, what are they getting at? And I mean, obviously, the title of the film can play in three different directions, right? Because they're literally taking their clothes off at the end. of the- And then they're like you mentioned, she's trying to get her career to take off by going and auditioning. And then the parents are perceiving her as taking off as in leaving. But to, to what end any of those have anything to say? I'm kind of still not at a loss, but searching for the meaning of what the film is really getting at. But I think for me, I think it's very interesting that the younger character in the film who we're meant to be following just as much as the parents is a cipher. And yes, she's a normal person who's not an actor. So that kind of helps because we don't expect a lot from her because she's not a professional actor. But I wonder if that also has maybe something to say in in regards to like they're maybe not heard as much as the kind of the older generation oh, maybe i'm grasping at straws i don't know it's just you mentioned lack of dialogue and that character gets essentially none mm-hmm. yeah yeah well I, and even just when you talk about the title i mean i think it was i don't know at what point they changed the title to taking off because it was originally spfc if you talk about a non-commercial title i mean that was yeah. originally the title was society for parents of uh, fugitive children which that <laughs> that acronym which was you know i mean yeah as, as, as few people saw it in 1971 even less would have seen it with that title yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah geez louise I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. We had a porno parody of taking off uh, at the last video store that I worked at in, in uh, Delaware. Uh, we it, it had the, it had like similar artwork, but it was something like I mean, it was like a vintage adult film that was like meant to capitalize on this hit that was not from Universal. Yeah. But um, I guess it was even like a soundtrack album. Like I mean, it was a Universal film, so like it had like some. I mean, it was being treated like a mainstream thing and then they just kind of like it just kind of fizzled but yeah there was there was a fair amount of like cultural like it, it, it was out there for people to show up and they just didn't show up for it mm-hmm. and, I, and i wonder if maybe it's because the movie just doesn't have enough to say it's not forceful enough with its message it's not being as transgressive as some people might have wanted at the time or I guess, pushing back on the transgressivism that was going on. Like, I, I wonder if it's just it because it kind of rides the the middle it, and it doesn't fall in one way or the other. Maybe that's why people weren't as motivated and animated to to go see it or tell people to go see it or to even be interested in seeing it. I, I don't know. I mean, Easy Rider is such a transgressive film in a lot of ways. Like, I could see why people were really interested in in watching that movie and having a conversation about it. Well, if you look back at the films that were actually hits from that period, I mean, 
I, there was a lot of youth films that all tanked at that time. I mean, some of them been covered on Mike's show, like Magic Garden of Stanley's Sweetheart. But there's a lot of films like that 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 didn't connect. I mean, Easy Rider was a biker movie, and Last Picture Show and American Graffiti and Summer Forty Two were nostalgia films. Love Story was a schmaltzy romance. Like they had big hits with young people, but they were not about the protest generation. They were not about like generational clash i mean there were things like the graduate they're like a little bit more a little bit more square a little bit more comedy of manners and i think that when you look at taking off and like oh it's another film about the generation gap right after strawberry statement and zabriskie point and getting straight and like all the uh, you know and uh, there's one other one um rpm like RPM, there's all these yeah. like films that come out in a glut uh magic garden stanley sweetheart and they just well, America's just not ready. For ones them. that failed, like Skidoo. Yeah, Skidoo is another one. Yeah, Bunny O'Hare. Yeah, yeah, uh, or, yeah. And and so it's just like all of these films that I I don't know if the I don't know if we overinflate in our in our looking back at them at, you know, from a distance like the demand for like that kind of youth culture film. Like I mean, music there was definitely like a big uh, interest in like you know films like Woodstock and Gimme Shelter. But I don't know. Um, if there was just not a big enough movie going audience to support films like this then. Um, and I, I think maybe just the fact that it was marketed like a, a youth hip hippie kind of movie would have scared off the, the, the Buck Henry Lynn Carlin crowd. And then, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just theorizing, but I mean, I like a lot of those movies, but it is interesting how so few of them really connected uh, with a, with an audience at the time. And the ones that did feel like a little bit safer and more uh, part of other genres. You know, like you said, Easy Rider is a biker. I mean, at its yeah. core, so that has the, everybody has that easy entry point. Like, I'm not sure what the easy entry point is here when you have a movie cutting back in the first 20 minutes between people singing varying degrees of quality and then Buck Henry. Like, I don't, not necessarily <laughs> sure where where the audience is going to land here and like who are you trying to corral in to get their attention it's i think maybe they're so kind of diametrically opposed that it's hard to find the audience it's almost two audiences trying to maybe be okay with seeing something they're not necessarily as interested in and waiting to get back to the more exciting stuff because i could see that as well given the kind of so obviously different things that they're showing on screen at least in the first you know half hour of the movie Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fellas, we should wrap up. Yeah, I was yep. going to say, anything else you guys want to say about, about the, man, we're just having easy, quick conversations this month, Mike. What the fuck? I know. What is going on, man? <laughs> I, I don't understand. It's like, yeah, these are movies. These are Milos Foreman films, folks. Sure are. Um, mm-hmm. Anything else we want to say on that? Uh, no, just that I hope more people can get a chance to see it. Yeah, yeah. same here. So yeah, I'll give you an opportunity, Bill. Uh, final thoughts on taking off? Um, no, just that it's uh, yeah, just that it's a film I've always really liked. You know, uh, I think that if people like the Czech New Wave period of uh, Foreman's career and haven't seen it, it's I think it's an interesting bridge to what he does in Hollywood. And um, yeah, it's one of those sleeper films that you always kind of hope more people will will check out. What about you, Mike? Yeah, I really can't say it any better than that. Um, it was. I'm glad that I finally saw this one. I think it was definitely worth the wait so um thank you chris for giving me the opportunity to uh watch these films and have some good conversations around them well no thank you for obviously programming the month as you know and bill for joining us um and you know my thoughts are, I, I mean similar to y'all's i mean obviously there are some scenes that we've talked about that you can easily find on youtube and you know the ode to a screw song is on there as well Bobo Bates's song. By the way, for those of you who don't know who the hell we're talking about, because I don't think we ever mentioned Bobo Bates is Kathy Bates. Oh yeah, you did. You <laughs> oh, did. okay. I don't remember if yeah. I did. I kept saying Bobo over and over again, like 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 some sort of idiot talking to a gorilla in the zoo. So, um, <laughs> but I I enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, I think it's just a, it's a weird intersection between two things, and I think it does end up working. But I totally understand why it's kind of is where it is. I wish. Movies like this were at the top of Criterion's list and less things like Wally and safe things that you can find everywhere else <laughs> in every 8 million other formats. Stuff like this is what we should be talking about getting new eyes on because, again, it didn't have necessarily the biggest audience at the time. And, you know, the Vincent Schiavelli stuff is fun, at least for that, at least for that. And Paul Benedict just, you know, being himself. So. Mm-hmm. 
That's right. On the next culture cast for Mike White May, we're going to be taking a look at another Milos Foreman film, Valmont. So until then, Bill, where could people find you and all of your collected works? Um, I think you could go to the Now Playing Network, uh, now www.nowplayingnetwork.net. I uh, am occasionally the uh, the co-host of Directors Club on there, and that's also where you can find uh, supporting characters and also my my short-lived mini series on Blue Velvet from the neighborhood. And um, yeah, I'm on twitter and instagram and facebook and all those places as well what about you mike uh yeah you can always find what i'm working on over at weirdingwaymedia.com where um you can hear my show the projection booth or any of the other stuff that i work on some with chris some without actually i think other than projection booth we do everything together chris we do that's yeah. correct your honor alleged ranking on bass all that stuff all the good stuff is over at weirdingwaymedia.com, uh, at least for the stuff Mike and I work on. And uh, yeah, I have my own stuff on there, but for this show, culturecast.com, patreon.com, if that's a thing you're interested in. If not, like, rate, and review the show wherever you get it, which is more than likely iTunes. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this has been fantastic. Hope to have you on again soon. Happy to do it. Yeah, no, this is great. And uh, Mike, as always, thank you so much for both joining us and for programming the month. Thank you. And as always, we'll catch you on the next episode. 